What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate, and look, we're back. It's season three. It's 2020. You know, you know, you're probably riding in your hover jet, or um, you know, petting your clone pig. I don't know what's happening in the future, but you know, it's 2020. Was my point? Like, it's a new year, and um, you know what we do? We have authentic conversations. Um, that center the underrepresented voices in the corporate space and corporate space is just another word for saying work. So a nine to five job. So underrepresented voices at work. That's what we do. We amplify those through having authentic conversations with black and brown um, executives, hiring partners, entrepreneurs, creatives, activists, artists, musicians, like anybody. Right. And we're having like these evergreen conversations. Like we're taking these evergreen topics rather, but we're centering them on, black and brown slash underrepresented perspectives. And we have like really great guests. Like season one, we had some really incredible guests. Season two, we had some really awesome guests. And season three is no different. We have with us today, Pamela Fuller with Franklin Covey. Pamela's work has always been tied to issues of inclusion with an emphasis on exploring the impacts of bias and pushing just a bit to make progress. For more than 15 years, Pamela has worked in both the public and private sector, supporting clients and solving complex problems. She currently serves as Franklin Covey's thought leader, inclusion and bias, as well as a global client partner responsible for supporting some of the organization's most strategic accounts. Her solutions oriented and client centric approach has resulted in unique solutions that exceed client expectations and achieve results. Pamela works with clients to match the right solution to organizational strategic priorities and is particularly adept at designing tailored competency-based programs to solve her clients most pressing needs through this work pamela has designed programs that have made an impact on hundreds of thousands yo hundreds of thousands of participants to include franklin covey's newest offering unconscious bias understanding bias to unleash potential Prior to her current role, Pamela served as an EEO and diversity analyst and trainer where she conceived and implemented proactive diversity programs to include human capital planning, training on unconscious bias and microaggressions, and statistical workforce analysis. She also served the nonprofit community for nearly a decade, executing marketing, communications, special events, and fundraising strategies. She is highly sought after consultant. I mean, come on. After everything I read, clearly she's a highly sought after consultant, speaker, and strategists having addressed leaders across the world on leadership topics to include unconscious bias, high potential leadership, and building an inclusive and effective culture to include the United Nations systems, U.S. federal government, and the Fortune 500. My goodness. I mean, come on, y'all. Like, if that doesn't get you off your seats, that don't get you paying attention to something. I mean, goodness. Pamela, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am good. I don't know that you ever get used to hearing your bio read. <laughs> I think <laughs> there's a humility that we're all raised up with um, that makes that feel so strange. So um, anyway, I'm just thrilled to be here and engage in this conversation. Man, you know, let's let's just get right into it, right? Like a critical part of any conversation is l- language and clear definitions. I think like, you know, the, the DNI space is it's been existing for a while, but I feel like we're seeing a shift in the past handful of years where I don't know, like just the, the, the intention around the work is, um, is just that more intentional. And so before we even get into this whole conversation, like, can we get your definition of inclusion and bias? Absolutely. I think inclusion, as I think about inclusion, I think we know we're being successful with inclusion when it is a metric of performance. If everyone in the organization feels included, valued, respected, then they are able to perform at their best. Um, And I think that's really important, that connection to performance, because quite often people talk about diversity and inclusion around sort of a moral responsibility or it being the right thing to do. And while I firmly believe all those things, I think that a conversation about the right thing to do is not as compelling in an organization as the impact on performance. So, yes, it's the right thing to do for lots of reasons. Ultimately, as a business or an organization, the reason it's most important is to ensure that we are positioning everyone to perform to meet whatever our goals or results are for the organization and people can't do that if they feel inhibited or encumbered or disrespected 
or ignored or tolerated, right? So inclusion is a, a sense that everyone feels they can contribute their best self and that they desire to do so. Um, because if I'm not included, I, I don't even want to give you my best ideas, right? Um, and yeah. I think bias, as we talk about bias, we define bias at Franklin Covey and, and in our new offering around um, we define it as a preference, a preference that we might have about a person or place or thing, a circumstance. And the word preference, I think, is really important to the definition, because when we think of bias, we often think of it being inherently negative. We think bias is a prejudice or a stereotype. And if it's inherently negative, we get a little bit defensive about it. So people bring up bias and a lot of people in organizations um, particularly people who don't feel like they've been on the receiving end of bias might get really defensive. You know, I don't, I don't have bias or I don't, I don't have prejudice. I don't have stereotypes. I sort of treat everyone fairly. But if we define it as a preference, we speak to what bias really is. It's a natural part of the human condition of how the brain works. And we have preferences that on their face don't have value, but they impact our behavior. And that behavior has a result that can be negative or positive. So bias is preferences we have about all Things, whether your desk is messy or gender or race, you know, bigger, heavier issues or the sorts of qualifications people have or where they went to school, where they're from in the country, all kinds of things. And that impacts how we interact with other people, how we handle circumstances, how we make decisions. Um, and those decisions um, or that impact, again, goes back to performance. So I think that these terms are really valuable when we can tie them to performance because that's the result of inclusion and bias no and i i'm right there with you right i think so many times let me take a step back so like i think premises t discussing premises are really important so i do believe in my experience and also from what i read as well as conversations that i've had with other leaders a lot of times when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's framed around uh, certain around around the comfort of the majority. So, mm. right. So, like when you talk, like just now, when you when you framed inclusion around performance, like that's that in itself is a differentiator. This is not even an ad for Franklin Covey, by the way, y'all. This is not an ad. I'm just I'm just trying to shout. I mean, but r with respect, like it's a differentiator because um, with with the tie into performance, there's also like a there's an underlying theme of accountability, right? Like if I'm tying something to performance, I'm tying something to something tangible and measurable. That means that there is an outcome that we're looking to achieve. I think mm -hmm. that I think a lot of times when we talk about inclusion, though, specifically, they are more so tied to like feelings or like mm -hmm. you said, like moral imperatives. And the reality is like, the world in operates today very exclusively. There are plenty of exclusive spaces and um, there are plenty of systems that are built off of exclusivity. So I don't know if that angle of positioning inclusion as like the right thing to do is going to win over the masses, because if you know, I, mean, I think I think if the moral imperative was that strong and people really vibe with it, we wouldn't have all the work that we have to do. So. It's interesting, though, kind of continuing on with, with the idea of inclusion. Um, a popular definition of inclusion is um, being asked to dance at the party you were invited to, right? Like, if people say it, I'm sure you've heard it, you hear it often, but like people, yeah. say, it, they, people say it like with such, like, I don't know, like, like it's just such a, like a swaggy thing to say. And I'm like, okay, I mean, it's cool. Um, but can we talk a little bit about the role that power plays in inclusion? Like, do you think that you can have inclusion of underrepresented employees without granting them some authority within the organization that they operate? Uh, no, <laughs> in short, <laughs> right? Um, but I think it sort of goes back to definition. So when we think about the moral imperative, there's a power dynamic in that as well, right? Because what, what we're saying, if you say it's a moral imperative, we're sort of putting it in the same box as charity, Mm. Like, this mm. is a, a goodwill, right? A charitable act mm. that I will do for these underrepresented groups is mm. to bring them into the conversation. Mm. So I think that's another reason I feel very strongly about reframing inclusion and bias around performance, because I think 
it's not a it's not a charity, right? There's an actual end result. There's whole populations we're leaving out of organizations, and that is detrimental to performance because ultimately organizations cannot serve. And I do a lot of work in the federal space. The federal government cannot serve the American people if it's not reflective of the American people. That's a big, grandiose example, but the same is true of private sector. Right. Your customers are reflective of a population or demographic, and you can't serve them if you don't reflect them. Um, so I, I think that power is an important part of this. And, and another thing that we see as we work with organizations is that organizations are typically more diverse at the front line. It's more it's difficult to get to diversity and inclusion in the senior ranks. And even as we look at the chief diversity officer or the office of diversity and inclusion or diversity, equity and inclusion or uh, even chief experience officer. Right. I think corporations are going through a bit of a vanguard in terms of what that role is even called. But it is it's interesting to see where that person sits in an organization and where they report. And I think that where they sit and where they report is a reflection of how strongly the organization feels about the value of diversity and inclusion efforts and their link to performance. Well, and and, and so where they sit, um, who they report to, and then also who they are, right? Like who they actually choose to be in those positions. Yeah, because I think that there is a bit of a, I don't know, there's a lot of... uh, talk about that across DNI professionals yeah. in terms of the identity of the person in that role and does it need to be someone from a marginalized group. Um, and I also think there's a sentiment sometimes, particularly in highly technical organizations, hmm. that HR issues generally are people who are like not technical enough. And so there's not always a lot of respect in an organization given to the capability of that person who sits in the role. Right. Um, which, which again, goes to your point about power, that if it's not a highly respected role, if it's not seen as highly valued, then there's there the person is limited in the impact that they can make across the organization. Well, you, and you know, it's interesting because I remember um, a couple of jobs ago, um, I was working And, um, you know, we had the black um, affinity group. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and you know, that, you know, every every there there were multiple different affinity groups and each affinity group had a leader. And for all the other groups, right, military, women, um, East Asian, LGBTQ, all the leaders were like senior managers or directors right so low to mid-level senior leaders but then for the the african-american affinity group it was like a like a like a like an experienced hire like someone who has been you know working for like four or five years so off top you're like okay i don't i don't y'all don't care about this the same way that y'all care about these other spaces you know what i mean yeah, and it sort of violates best practice, right? So best practice of, around employee resource groups or affinity groups or business resource groups, again, sort of an evolution that organizations are going through. And each of those titles has a different contribution to make to the organization. But hmm. um, best practice across any of those structures is that there be executive sponsorship of the group and that the person who is the executive sponsor Um, isn't necessarily part of the group because there's research that shows that when we look at diversity and inclusion efforts, if women and people of color are elevating those efforts or pushing them forward, if people in the marginalized group are pushing them forward, it can actually hurt their career over the long term because it seems self-serving, right? It seems like, you know, I'm a black woman, I'm a Latina woman, and I'm like, we need more diversity in the senior ranks, right? It seems like I'm saying hire me. Whereas when a white man um, does that same sort of advocacy for issues of diversity and inclusion, it seems benevolent, right? Because they don't actually, at least on its face, they don't have anything to gain from that advocacy. So one of the best practices for impact in any sort of whatever the structure is, affinity group, employee resource group, or business resource group, is to have an executive sponsor who's not a member of the group. So you sort of counteract this research, right? You have an advocate who's not part of the group and who you know, for lots of reasons is sort of more trusted at the executive level because it doesn't seem self-serving to that point. I think when you talk about, um, we talk about inclusive inclusiveness and we've talked about 
on Living Corporate, we've talked about sponsorship and mentorship in the past. Like to me, like that's the biggest opportunity strategically and then just organizationally when you talk about like the next step when it comes to employee resource groups. It's like these ERGs are spaces where um, others are able to kind of kind of cluster together and uh, either either be kind of like other with themselves or just kind of be out of the way. But not necess- but but it kind of it, it puts responsibility on underrepresented employees. It fully charges black and brown, um, LGBTQ, disabled. It fully charges non white men, non straight white men to be in charge of their own inclusion efforts. Right. Like they're not we're not really connecting the dots between the folks who actually have authority, access and power with these underrepresented folks. I often see. Um, these groups kind of just operate autonomously, it, like almost like they're an island into themselves, as opposed to them being connected to this larger organizational strategy. Is that something that you've seen often, or do you like are, are you are you seeing a shift in how these ERGs engage and work within the larger leadership structure? I I see that as well, and I think um, it's you know I I don't see necessarily like a wave of engagement in the larger leadership structure. I think some organizations are just better at it than others Okay. for lots of, you know, either it's a longer standing program or sort of the people at play, or there are executives who have made it their business to be part of these groups. I think one of the challenges with employee resource groups is the burden, as you've highlighted, sits with the population and even the effort that they put towards it, right? Like we are all in the workplace. We have, you know, everyone I speak to across public and private sector, you know, small, medium, large companies, multinational companies, everyone is doing two jobs. Everyone is overworked and there are just not enough hours in the day. So then you look at demographics for underrepresented groups in corporate structures and you're thinking, wow, and we've got like, a handful of our high performers putting additional effort and energy towards making these employee resource groups meaningful, which feels a little bit counterintuitive, right? When you're trying to sort of close the gap and accelerate in the leadership ranks. So I think employee resource groups need to be part of a larger strategy um, because they do serve a purpose. I mean, when I look, so in our program, and to your point, not a plug, but just an example of uh, <laughs> that I think an, an illustration that I think might be helpful as we yeah. think about this is uh, we do an exercise around a network audit and just sort of looking at your network and doing an audit and your personal and professional network in terms of who you choose to go to, like when you have a problem or when you um, have a new project or when you're seeking coaching or mentorship about a specific issue. And when I do that activity for myself, I noticed that my personal network is very reflective of me. I mean, it's like women of color who are college educated, often have a higher degree of an MBA um, and are uh, sort of in fast paced jobs and um, sort of big jobs. And and on paper, we look very similar. And that serves a purpose that's valuable for me, for my own sense of belonging and sort of ensuring that I'm navigating things the right way and sharing my personal experience and the the challenges I have that are specifically related to my role as a working mother of two brown boys in America. Right? Yeah. Um, my professional network is much more diverse. There are many more men in my professional network. Um, there are men in higher level positions. There are also women. There's a lot of a lot more geographic diversity because Franklin Covey is a global company, and because I've worked and lived in other states outside of Washington D.C., where I currently live, or Virginia, I should say, just outside of D.C. Um, and so I think that. And when I look at that, I look, I I ask the question, where do I have opportunity? Where do I have opportunity to expand my network, both for my own sense of um, sort of professional growth and development and belonging and inclusion, as well as, um, you know, as as well as for the the benefit of my network, if you will. Um, And so I think ERGs serve a a purpose like it's valuable for me to have a network that is reflective of me because sometimes you know you don't have to explain things you can say like this happened right. and 
people in your network who reflect you say, oh, I know when that happens, this is what I've done. You, you know, whereas when people are different than you, there's a little bit more effort that you have to put in. You have to explain your perspective or explain why that might be problematic or ask the question differently. So I think they serve a purpose. It's valuable to have that network. And we see that organizations who don't have those sorts of networks really struggle to retain diverse talent. Um, and to promote diverse talent, but it can't be the only thing, right? Organizations have to have a multi-pronged strategy that doesn't put the burden only on those people to build a network for themselves. So there need to also be some formal mentoring and coaching opportunities in place. There needs to be engagement of the majority in minority efforts. There needs to be formal leadership development opportunities and, you know, rotational assignments for people and, uh, you know, surveys that indicate what people's experience is and then response to that survey data, right? Most organizations do do sort of employee engagement surveys. They don't necessarily respond to what they hear and try to bridge those gaps. So I think when ERGs are the organization's only strategy, that's a problem. But well, as part of a larger strategy, I've seen them be really effective because there's a purpose that that serves and it's valuable. No, you're absolutely right. I think I think the challenge is that for so many organizations, ERGs is like the beginning and end of their D E and I strategy, right? Like it's okay. Hey, we set these things up for y'all to be different over there. So have your happy hours. Let us know uh, what the budget is. You got about $600 for the year and enjoy yeah. yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but buy I, one bottle of wine, get your one bottle yeah. of wine and celebrate your one promotee and enjoy right so it's but like jokes jokes aside right i think not not really wasn't a joke but pessimistic commentary <laughs> aside skepticism <laughs> aside yes 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 um it it's interesting because i think what what that does also account for it's like the emotional labor that goes into like one even just being a part of an erg but then two working and trying to build one up right so like you said we all have these full-time jobs i'm a consultant and so, yeah. so it's like, okay, I'm already working on a billable engagement. Then I have some additional work that I'm doing to like sell something else. And then maybe I'm even working on some, a white paper or, or some research or something else. And then on top of that, you want me to lead a whole ERG, like, or you want me to participate in one, like even participating, right? I think it's, it's really easy. And I, I, I had a conversation with some colleagues, um, some months ago. And they were talking about, well, we want to we're going to judge ERG engagement um, by how many people show up to events. And I was trying to explain. I said, well, f well, wait a minute. Like that can't be your only measure for judging engagement or participation, because some people may just honestly, if you just sent out an email once a month with like some type of professional tip or, or I did some type of blogging series or like there are people who maybe just like to observe, they might not necessarily want to show up physically and hang around and hang out after a whole week's week long of work, because even showing up in spaces where we're the majority can sometimes be performative because we don't know everybody. Like we, I don't know you like, yes, you and I both might be black, but we're not a monolith. Like I still need to build up trust and that, that, that in itself can be an emotional exercise. So how do we, you know, how do we account for the, the, the labor that's involved in just being present in these spaces, right? I'm already exhausted from being present everywhere else. So now I'm going to be present here. This can be positive, but it just, we need to make sure that we're accounting for that, that, that effort. Cause it is an effort. It's not just automatic. I think it's really easy um, outside looking in just to think that everybody wants to just pop up to everything or do a happy hour or do insert whatever activity it is when it's like, man, you know, honestly, I would just benefit from somebody just sending me a note <laughs> or I would just benefit from a phone call um, or just listening on a conference call or re reading like again, reading a newsletter. I don't necessarily know if I need to like be physically present somewhere on top of all the things I'm doing for me. Right. I and mean, again, I'm not down. I'm not dismissing the reality that these events are great. They can be, but everybody's different. And, you know, I, I've yet to talk to one black person, black or brown person at work who hasn't like 
significantly dealt with some BS at, at their job that they're have actively trying to manage through and smile through. So like when you think about that kind of stuff and then now, now I got to kind of do this other thing. It can just kind of be a bit much, you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, and I think personality wise, so it's hard because, you know, understanding the value that ERGs play and how they are helpful for some people. And then like being personally an introvert, it's a little bit hard for me (laughs) (laughs) Um, to go back to something I said earlier. They just need to be part of a more holistic strategy. And even I guess how they run like so many times companies are using the term employee resource group and it really is an affinity group. It's a club. It's a club. And there's sort of a, there's a clickiness that can come from clubs that is not helpful. And so I think I believe really strongly in meaningful connection. I think that sometimes the DNI community can even become sort of an, in, a little bit insular in terms of how it thinks about, you know, you, you sort of get a group of DNI professionals together and they're like, this is the answer. Because we've seen, you know, it's a decades old profession and we haven't seen monumental, humongous shifts in representation, no. right? So there's a list of best practices. And I think the, the DNI community, you know, myself included as part of it, it's like we latch on to these things and say, well, let's, let's do this. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. but there is like each organizational structure is really different mm. and it's important to take into account what is going to work in the organization to solve those specific challenges. I think, you know, we look at like lean six Sigma and it's a process that you can apply to processes, you know, process improvement to mechanism. You can apply to process improvement yep. to find efficiencies across any number of processes. I don't think diversity and inclusion is the same in terms of like having sort of one process that can be applied to everything. I think understanding the organizational culture and context is really important. And then understanding what the people at the organization want is also really important. Um, So I think ERGs have their purpose, but I think it's, it, I, I also think, I guess, in the in the measure of that, it's important to do some evaluation around, like, is this an affinity group? Um, and do the people who are part of it want it to be an affinity group? Or do they want it to be more of an employee resource group that is focused more on mentoring, coaching, and sponsorship, or more sort of meaningful connection versus safe space, right? I think yeah. affinity groups are like safe space. Come to this thing, the happy hour, or here's a sort of best practices or like who to go to for what employee resource groups are more building your network and influence across an organization, sponsorship, coaching, mentoring, sort of intense focus on promotion and leadership development. And then business resource groups are very tied to strategy, right? How are we like, is this the black business resource group, the BRG going to, you know, build us a new customer channel or a new Mm -hmm. revenue stream, right? Based on their connection to the, company. So I think organizations are not always clear on like what it is they're actually setting up. Right. And is that in alignment with the participants and what they're looking for? Right. Um, Cause I just think it takes some extra work, right? It's easy to say, let's set up these things. It's harder to say, let's do some analysis around what kind of thing we need to set up and what it needs to do. You know what? I don't think that I've had any conversation with anyone really. I've had, let me take that back. I've had one conversation with someone who has like in private and they were talking about like off off the mic, talking about the difference between an ERG and a BRG. But I don't know if I've ever had someone really articulate the difference between these different groups. I think that a lot of times what I'm seeing is that we're just using these terms interchangeably, right? Without any type of thoughtful definition as to what they mean because I can say that like there's one huge tech organization that uses affinity group and they're doing way more than another tech organization that I know it that is using BRGs the term BRG yep. right yeah um, but but I just got to give you a flex bomb because I've never heard someone like just very simply explain why those terms mean different things and why they matter so hold on one second come on sound man drive before we write here you know what I'm saying that's a that's a DJ flex bomb you know do you know a funk master flex are you familiar? Yeah, I like it. I'll take it. I appreciate like, it. No I've won the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this has actually been a very like sound effect light podcast, but you know what? You know, we're going to, we're going to pick it up here. So, um, <laughs> let's, let's do this. Um, 
But let's talk about diversity within the context of inclusion. In your opinion, can an organization be inclusive and not be diverse? Like, is a white boys club inclusive? I mean, I think this is the age old diversity of thought discussion. (laughs) So organizations will say, you know, we don't look very diverse. Like on our face, we all look the same, but we have so much diversity of thought. We all look at things really differently. And I think, I mean, diversity of thought exists across everyone. Like there's a reality to we're all individuals who are bringing our own contribution to the table. But I did, um, so I I used to work at the U.S. Department of Defense, and I was facilitating years ago this senior executive diversity seminar. So it was a group of senior executives from various agencies. DOD is is a big agency with a lot of subordinate agencies within it. So it wasn't people who were working together every day. They were, like, in different places across DOD. And we're facilitating this conversation around diversity and inclusion. It's a couple day seminar, multi day seminar. And one of the participants, I, I will never forget this, stood up. It was a woman. And she said, for whatever diversity that exists across this group of people, like whatever identity diversity exists, and it was pretty diverse gender wise. Mm-hmm. Um, with like one or two black and brown people, but otherwise uh, didn't, at least on, you know, they were all about the same age and everyone seemed like they were able-bodied, at least from my, you know, from what I could see. Um, But she said, for whatever identity diversity exists in this group, we're all actually exactly the same person. She said, if you lined up our resumes, there's sort of a path to becoming a senior executive at the Department of Defense. So we've all, for the most part, had prior military service and we've all, uh, you know, we were all willing to move all, all over the world to serve in our next post, which is sort of a, you know, a, a thing that's important at DOD. And, and so she, she sort of rifled through some things and said, you know, we've all gone to this sort of handful of institutions, right? The Naval Academy or West Point or whatever. We're all from, we all probably maybe started like a, a big part of DOD is the recruitment happens in the southeastern U.S., right? So we're all like from, she just sort of railed through these things about all the ways that they were the same. And I think it was a, it was really an interesting just thought in the room around like how, you know, as an organization, as a huge organization, how does the DOD like build and grow leaders? They often do so, like many organizations, you sort of build and grow leaders one way. Um, And it's the way that's worked before. So you replicate that, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, you hired an engineer for this role when you look at and the engineer did really well. And then you look at the job responsibilities and you decide, well, they must have an engineering degree to do this well, even though the job responsibilities don't necessarily require the engineering degree. But then, you know, for the rest of eternity, it requires the engineering degree. Right. Mm. So I think um, I, I think that organizations lean into what they can attest to, right? What they can say they have. I think inclusivity is about behavior. And so I do think the organization can be inclusive, can behave in a way where everyone feels respected, valued, included. They feel like they can tie to performance. But I I would push further to say, but do those behaviors really exist if it's not a diverse workforce? Because it means that there's some bar of entry, right? right. <laughs> like we don't stated so or I'm otherwise. Not, yeah, stated or otherwise. Like in pra- and I think organizations will say, like, well, you know, we're based in Iowa and it's not that diverse, or like we're a family company and so we're sort of small and not, you know, we just word of mouth, right? And my question is always, you know, what is the opportunity? Right. I mean, I, I did some work in rural um Minnesota <laughs> a few <laughs> months ago. Context matters, yes. Yeah, and I was like, I thought I was, I was honestly, um, I thought it was in, like, the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. Mm. And then, like, two days before, they were like, okay, when you land, we need to pick you up, and it's a five-hour drive north. It's like, oh my god, we're going to Canada. Like, I was, <laughs> I was not <laughs> prepared for that. But it was really fascinating, because I had a perception of what it's like to live in rural Minnesota, and that that was probably predominantly white people. But there's, um, several large Indian tribes. There's a growing like Somali population in the state of Minnesota. Generally, there's like the, this 
sort of large um, Hmong Chinese enclave and I think a Vietnamese population, right? And just, so in the course of this session that I was delivering and this conversation we were having, I could easily imagine an organization based in rural Minnesota saying, well, we're not diverse because like the people aren't here. But in the course of this conversation with their community foundations, it's like, well, it sounds like there's a lot of different people here, right? Yeah. So I think the thing I would push on for if an organization says we're really inclusive and we have diversity of thought you know or we you know we're just not uh diverse population are interested in working here or like we've tried to recruit and it doesn't work or you know we just uh you know most of our hires are through referral or word of mouth i would just push on that and say is that the best way is that the best way to source candidates is that the best way to bring innovation into your organization is that the best way to look at things differently like there's an opportunity in that um that I think organizations don't necessarily claim. They sort of talk it away. It's like, well, no, it's your responsibility as an organization to explore that opportunity, in my opinion, um, particularly, again, as we tie to performance. Because if you're not doing it, then you're not doing everything you can to enhance the performance of the organization. So, you know, you, and you've talked about performance quite a bit, like, and you, like in terms of you've said the term and you've talked about tying it back. Can you give us like a practical example of what it means to tie inclusion to performance? the easiest thing for people to relate to is an individual example is to say, if I feel encumbered in any way, if I feel, so I worked for, a, I'll give you an example personally. So I worked for a, a woman for a long time who on, on its face, identity wise, we were very similar and she sort of self identified herself as my mentor. And I worked with her and I would complete projects for her and briefings and the federal space briefings are a big deal. So you sort of work on them. They're very detailed and, you know, in consulting as well, right? Like you, pre you prep a deck, right, for a, a presentation and the details are important. Right. And it gets reviewed by all the important people and then, and then someone delivers it. And so at the time I was much more junior and I wouldn't be the person who delivered it. But we'd mm -hmm. be in these meetings and because I'm the one who prepared it, right, the person who prepared it knows all the details. They know why the period is in that specific place. Right, right. And so I'd be, <laughs> there'd be questions and she clearly wouldn't know the answer to those questions. She'd sort of look at me and I would answer the question and then sometimes I would like throw in my two cents about it because that is my way. And <laughs> she would say, and whenever I had like, whenever I sort of got too big in my boots or like had too much of a thought about it, she would stop me in front of everyone and she would say, Pamela, as your mentor, I think that's a private conversation we need to have. I need to give you some guidance on that. Um, let's not, you know, that kind of thing. And so I think that. So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on before, before you just fly past that, like what was, <laughs> <laughs> um, me has, has, has someone said that to me, I look at them like, like what you can't so what did, what did you say what did you do i mean i was so you know power was at play right like i was a and in that at that time in that role i was a contractor i wasn't even like a full-time employee i was a con an on-site yeah. contractor for this for this work and so in front of all these senior leaders you know and at the behest of my boss i don't i didn't really feel like i had an option i mean i need i needed my job so <laughs> i was you know i would sort of shut up and just um you know oh sorry about that look forward to talking with you about it privately right yeah and just try to try to move through and, and control my facial expressions um but when we think about performance right that's very limiting and so like that only had to happen, a, you know, I'm a quick learner, like that only had to happen a handful of times before I understood that I didn't really need to be giving anyone my best ideas. And I frankly didn't need to be putting my best ideas into these briefings. Like right. if she was going to do them and she didn't need my thoughts. Right. I think it's the same as, you know, we, you often hear in diversity in terms of inclusion, best practices about amplification, which came mm -hmm. out of the Obama White House, the senior policy women realized that they were being skipped over. I mean, that is a direct connection to performance. You've got this idea or you have a, you're, you're all trying to solve a problem. You have a suggestion right. and it's ignored. I mean, how many times do you keep doing that before you just decide like, you know what? I, I'm not going to do it. Like it's not listen, worth it. Right. It's, listen, it's not worth it. It take, I think, and it's funny because like the older I've gotten, the shorter my fuse is with that stuff, right? Like if I take the time and I really put together things, cause 
you know, at a certain point, you know, you, you live life long enough. You don't really need validation on every single thing. So, you know, if you put a good idea forward and people just glaze over it or they ignore you or they co-opt it in some way, it's like, ah, okay. I'll, all right. I'll, I'll keep those to myself from now on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think these sorts of slights, um, are limiting to performance. And I think in a, if we were to look at like team dynamics, right, the boss who minimizes certain people while elevating other people, that inhibits performance. And you rely on, I mean, management is the highest calling. Like in a manager's role, you have infinite impact because you're impacting the performance of your entire team. And you're very much a connector, right? When you think of sort of middle management, you're a connector between the front line and then the operational or strategic perspective in the organization. And so you look at a manager who's doing that over the course of their, you know, 20 year role career as a manager managing people. And what sort of impact does that have on performance of that team over the long term and how that team interacts with other teams and how we solve problems. So I think and I think, in you know, you look at retail and of course, like the common example Right. Is the Starbucks incident a couple of years ago or Sephora last year? I mean, if that's not inhibiting performance, I don't know what is the performance in retail is whether you have consumers who are buying. Right. Right. And so if you've got whole groups of the population that have that who you've shown through this mishap and through this behavior that they're not um, welcome in your space or you're not interested in them consuming. I mean, that has a serious impact on performance. Well, you know what? And it's interesting because as you say that, I think about like another really practical, like a performance indicator. It's just around like the retention of your team. Right. So like, like yeah. right. So like in tech, like there's this, at least from a marketing perspective, there's an ongoing push for these tech spaces to be more inclusive, to be more diverse, to be more welcoming um, of underrepresented employees, not just at the, um, first at the non-manager levels but at the manager and senior manager and executive levels as well and yet yeah and yet like we're seeing that like these tech companies are just burning first of all tech is like a high burn like consulting um fang like those different groups are high burn places for everybody um and they're particularly high burn for uh underrepresented folks right black and brown women um lgbtq uh, of course, tr- uh, trans individuals, it's high, 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 high burned, high turnover for these spaces. And um, it's interesting because I don't know. I, I'm a manager like <laughs> I'm a manager at a fairly large uh, tech consulting firm and retention of my team or, you know, how I'm able to help retain um, or drive retention of. Um, underrepresented folks is not measured. Now, me, I'm, I'm rewarded for recruiting people in. If I can refer somebody and I, I bring them in, I have very hefty rewards for that. But what I don't, but but what isn't measured, um, ten, for me anyway, explicitly is how we make sure those people stay. Yeah. I think, like, also the other reality of sort of consulting environments and, like, high burn, high churn organizations is that we often dismiss people who leave as, like, it's a failing on their part. So we say like people left because they can't hack it, like they can't cut it. It's too intense. We don't, organizations, I think more and more organizations are getting better at this, but I think lots of organizational cultures are designed to say like, that's not our responsibility. Like I got you here. It's not necessarily my responsibility to keep you. They don't say that like on their face, you know, publicly they talk about the value of retention and strategies to retain people and, you know, exit interviews, but Like the culturally, the organization, someone will leave and everyone else will hear like, oh, they weren't really cut out for this anyway. Or like, it's okay that they're not here anymore. So I think some of that cultural reality makes it tough, too. There's a dollar value, though, with with turnover. It costs money for people to leave. Right. So unless like someone is like a legal risk to the to the company, seven, eight times out of ten, it's cheaper to keep them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's just odd. It's odd to me that like we're not and I don't know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Maybe, maybe we'll bring on somebody later in the season around like, why is it that the recruitment efforts are so like so emphasized and marketed, but the retention efforts aren't? Because, to, I mean, I, I I know enough about human resources to know that um, hiring somebody just to have them leave like a year, a year and a half later 
is like and just a crazy cost right yeah and so even so even if to your point like around the culture it's like if we're not talking about from a moral perspective or even an ethical perspective even if you just look at it from like a dollar's perspective there should be some type of focus on that um i think that leads me well into my next question about um inclusivity and employee engagement i think it's fair though before we get into that for us to actually define what employee engagement actually means so um as a as a subject matter expert and just from your perspective pam what how do you define employee engagement so i think a lot of organizations talk about fit and i think in the realm of diversity and inclusion and particularly bias conversations fit is a bit of a four letter word and i think organizations put the burden of fit on the person who works in the organization so you know they have to fit in our team And I would argue that the burden is actually on the organization to create an environment where people fit, right? Like where they're, they can lean into their strengths and and make a contribution, which is, I think, ultimately what everyone wants to do. I mean, we all go to work for a paycheck, but you have a choice about where you get that paycheck from and how you spend your time. And so I think the burden is, is on the organization to create environments where people can fit, um, regardless of their identity, where their identity is not in a hindrance to them fitting, quote unquote, in the organization. And if uh, such an environment is created, I think that um, helps employee engagement or I think that is a determining factor to employee engagement. If I feel like I belong in the organization, like I fit, like they've made space for me to be exactly who I am and make a contribution that I find meaningful that also contributes to the bottom line of the organization, then I am engaged. And that includes, you know, everything from organizational policies that tell me that I belong there to how my manager treats me or how my colleagues engage with me. And, you know, it's it's interesting um, because I I know that like this idea around employee engagement, a lot of times um, it is in, I did some work. I did some work with um, this was like before I was a consultant, but um, I was a part of this energy company and Gallup was doing this whole like employee engagement survey for them. And yeah. And Do you have a best friend at work? <laughs> That's their that's their like infamous question. You know that that's like that like boy like no shade to Gallup because I want you to come on here. But boy, when they asked that at the time, this was some years ago. Boy, you would have thought they had figured out the question to ask. I was like, this is it's it's a it's it's one question, it's one question, guys. Like it's okay. Yep, we get it. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's not a huge indicator of a lot. But in that work with Gallup, I remember that like one of the key talking points they had was like, look, employee disengagement isn't just like, it's not just when the person is crossing their arms at their desk or always taking vacation or always sick or all, or actively searching for another job on their computer. It's earlier than that, right? It's not that extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm curious, like what is your experience and research shown you about how employee disengagement manifests and then how it's related to inclusive workspaces? I think like as a manager, when you look at your, when you look sort of out across your team, there are people who are excited to be there. So I think it's, it's less about, I I think, again, sometimes we put the burden of employee engagement on the employee, like they're looking, you know, they're, they're on Facebook at work, or they're like, you know, keeping Amazon in business during working hours, (laughs) or they're showing up late or whatever, like, in it, we turn it into a discussion around like employee behavior and etiquette. Hmm. But I think there's like a great, I mean, I think many people have great professional integrity and they'll be disengaged and wouldn't be so belligerent right. in their behavior, <laughs> right? right? Like, um, they would, you know, search for their new job after hours on their home computer. Right. And I, and I think it's, it's when they come in and they would even continue trying to go like trying to do a good job and make a contribution, but it's, you know, they're, um, they're doing what's asked and not necessarily coming to you with additional ideas or, and they're not collaborating, right? They're, you, you assign them something and you, I mean, engaged employees are 
actively engage with their team, not only when they're directed to do so. Right. So I think the sort of solitary nature of an employee is an early indicator that they're not engaged. Right. Because when I'm engaged and I have something exciting and I work remotely, so you have to be even more sort of deliberate about how you connect with people. But right. Um, you know, when, when I'm engaged and I'm excited about what I'm working on, I mean, I, I, I will call my colleagues just to say, like, I want to hear what you think about this. Or like, I just got this exciting, you know, the client just asked me for this thing. I'm sort of excited about it and would love to hear your ideas. Or can I run this by you? Right. I think how they're engaging, not just from, a, um, I don't know, administrative standpoint yeah. in terms of like, do they show up on time? I think it's more, <laughs> it's more about, um, you know, are they working in isolation? Are you seeing them actively engage with other people in the office? Like, yeah. do, do they have things at their desk that are of a personal nature? You know, I mm. think sometimes people, I think people who don't feel like it's a right fit are much more cautious about that, right? They don't have pictures of their kids up or their partner or their puppy, right? Right. Um, you know, what, what do they do at lunch? Hmm. And what does that behavior look like? So I think it comes across in, in how they're relating to other people in the organization. When I think about what it means for leaders then to not undermine um, inclusivity or engagement at work, right? I mean, I believe it, it calls for a much higher level of emotional intelligence and general empathy than we're giving folks credit for. And I, I question if organizations are doing everything they need to be doing to develop those muscles for leaders to even be sensitive and aware of of those pieces that you just outlined. Right. Because everyone has their own motivations. They have their own um, insecurities. They have their own pressures. And so it's I could I empathize with the idea that, OK, you have these leaders coming in and they have these different metrics and things they have to hit. And also they need to be highly astute and aware of um, where their employee is, if they're paying attention, if the, they as leaders are creating an environment or opportunities for them to collaborate, if they're modeling collaboration, right? Like, I mean, in your work with Franklin Covey, have you had situations where you've um, had to have those types of conversations with leaders on how they can create more engaging environments? Um, I talk about that every day. I mean, I think that's a big thrust of our approach around unconscious bias and really all of our content. So I think emotional intelligence had a moment, hmm. right? It, it had a time and it was a word people were using, but it's sort of like self-awareness. Like people say, it's really important that you're you know, self-aware as a leader. And everyone says, I'm very self-aware. And then you talk to them for five minutes and you're like, I don't know that you know what self-aware means. Right. I don't think you're using that term correctly. Right. Um, and so, <laughs> so I think emotional intelligence is sort of similar. Like, you know, people know the four dimensions of emotional intelligence um, you know, it's sort of like their disc profile, like they'll say I'm an EITJ or whatever. Right. And it just becomes this like default of like I am or I am not. Right. And I believe emotional intelligence is a skill that you can build. And I think empathy is important, but I also think curiosity is important. You know, our, our yeah. CEO, Bob Whitman, did an interview recently and he said curiosity is the sort of number one leadership competency or quality no doubt. that he looks for in, an organ in a in a person and I think um, I just feel so strongly about that because I think you can't be empathetic around information that you don't have like I can't just the goal is not to just be an empath who feels everyone's feelings right the goal <laughs> the goal is to to learn something about someone that helps you relate to them so as we were prepping you know for the interview i talked about my kids and you mentioned that you are welcoming a child soon this is a point of connection we can have some empathy about that right i right. can immediately think about what it was like when my kids first showed up um and how lovely that was right and and the sort of high emotion of that experience um or, you know, you can hear me talk about my three-year-old and think, oh, wow, in three years, I'll have a three-year-old. Like, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, So I think that the curiosity piece is really important. And I think as managers, um, 
what I talk with managers quite often about is making the time for that. I think managers feel, particularly first line leaders, you know, they were in a role as an individual contributor. They get promoted to that first line leadership level and they often still continue to do their individual contributor role and try to manage people. Right. On top of that. On top of that. And they, and there's just not enough time to do it. So, of course, you have to delegate and you have to trust your people. And there are strategies for how you can build trust in your people, build the capability of your people. But that has to be your new focus. And part of that is making some real time to cultivate connection among your team. And so, like, we'll talk with managers um we talk quite often at Franklin Covey about the value and importance of having one-on-ones and having a structure for those one-on-ones so that they're meaningful. It's not just a drive by at your desk, right? It's not um, a weekly staff meeting, but actually having a one-on-one with people. And I'll talk to managers and they say, well, we have our annual performance review. And it's like, that's ridiculous. You right. can't have this conversation once right. around a perf- and and around a performance document, no less, right? So right. the one time that we engage in a one-on-one meeting, it's going to be a high-stakes conversation, right. Where, <laughs> right, right. Where, I'm gonna, where your livelihood, is, where your livelihood is directly on the line. This one exactly, time. Right. exactly. And so, um, so I talk to leaders all the time about making the time and also being. I think we've got, you know, there are lots of introverts and lots of people to whom personal engagement doesn't feel natural, particularly at work. Because I think we're still fighting a little bit of the battle of like, I have a work persona and I have a personal persona. You know, one of the models we use at Franklin Covey to think about that is the whole person paradigm and just that you don't you don't leave parts of yourself at home. Hmm. Right. You're a whole person all the time. Right. And um, and I really uh, ascribe to that. I pers- I believe in that level of authenticity, and I think we need to work deliberately to build that level of authenticity across teams. Managers need to ensure that they do know what someone's career goals are. Like, where do they see themselves in the future, and what are they interested in, and what are they excited about working on, and who do they really like to work with and who are they challenged by? And as a manager, can I find opportunities for them to connect with somebody they're challenged by so that we can improve our total dynamic, right? right. Um, in college, you know, I worked in college and I, um, the best manager I've ever had, I worked for in college be- and she sort of sat me down and was like, you know, I know that you work here and we have these goals around what we're doing. I worked in the student activity center and we did programming around diversity and inclusion, actually. (laughs) And she said, but, but you are a, you're a college student sort of at the beginning of your career and life. And it's important to not, um, you know, to not be myopic in terms of how you look at your goals. And so she gave me a little hint. She just like made a little handout and it had, all these different categories. It was like finances and health and wellness and relationships and my yeah. family. And and she said, every three months, every quarter, we're going to sit down and just look at this and, and look at what your goals are. I'm going to share with you my goals, right? So there was some vulnerability in it. It wasn't just like, I will divulge my whole life story and you'll coach me through it. She was also sharing her goals. And particularly at a time like in college right so my goal was like I do not want to get my cell phone cut off again I need to find a way to pay this bill right and (laughs) hers was hers was we're gonna buy a house I was like wow a house right like the process of getting through a mortgage like there's just it's a small example of how a manager built connection with me in through curiosity and empathy right she was vulnerable about what her goals were she took the time to have this quarterly conversation with me. She created a space where I could talk about my whole self and all the everything I was dealing with at that moment in my life. Yeah. And I think managers can do that on different scales based on the organizational culture and what is and is not appropriate to discuss and all that. But sure. managers can do something like that with every member of their team and they should. Right. Right. You shouldn't be having one annual performance conversation with your team. You shouldn't also there are lots of employees who will say they're they only speak to their manager to get assignments. Right. So their manager just does drive by their desk or calls them into their office to say, here, work on this Um, and never to have like a more meaningful, really transactional. Exactly. And um, for managers, that managers will also lean into that. They'll say, well, no, it's just that I'm really efficient and, you know, I don't. (laughs) 
I don't like to spend time in chit chat or that right. kind of thing. And it's more than that. It's not chit chat. It's not. There's substance to having a meaningful conversation with somebody. Oh, that's just so true. Um, so we, you talked about bias and like you've used the term bias. You've, just, you've even said unconscious bias. Um, it seems as if the default when anytime we talk about bias within that diversity and inclusion space is that it's unconscious. Do you think it's a fair do you think that's a fair observation? And if so, why do you think that when we talk about bias, we're often talking about unconscious bias and not just bias? I think that's fair. I think, you know, really critical to any conversation I have about bias is about bringing the unconscious to consciousness, but also acknowledging that conscious bias exists. So it's sort of, I think, conscious, unconscious bias can sometimes be used negatively, just like diversity of thought. Yeah. Like diversity of thought is really valuable, but it shouldn't be the reason you don't have diversity in other dimensions. Right. And um, unconscious bias is really important, and it doesn't negate the reality that there are very conscious bias that exist and impact people's decisions. So... I always include that in any conversation I'm having about bias or any facilitation I'm doing. And the distinction is that conscious bias are things we can state directly. And so, like, once you can say it, it's no longer an unconscious bias. So you'll hear people say, like, I have an unconscious bias around uh, mothers of young children. Like, no, I really just don't want to be... Hiring mother and mothers of young ch- right, and that, children, right? Like, that's a like conscious bias. You just you mm-hmm. just said it, <laughs> right? Once you've said it, it's not unconscious anymore, and yeah. it's important for people to reconcile that. You know, you're you're running interviews, and for all the candidates of color, you're asking them about like office etiquette. You know, appropriate dress attire and showing up to work on time, and like how to provide good customer service, and then for all your like non-person of color all your white candidates you're asking them about like the substantive job responsibilities right right right. Right. and then someone someone and someone brings it to your attention because interviews are often done in panel there's usually more than one person at the interview which is best practice and they say hey i sort of i noticed that we spent like an inordinate amount of time with some of those candidates talking about what time they need to be at work and i just I feel like at this level of a position, that's not that significant. And I sort of noticed that you only ask some of them that and not others. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I I had this black lady working for me once and she was always late. And I just want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Right. <laughs> Someone says to you, well, that sounds like you've got a bias around that. I mean, once it's been brought to your attention, you don't get to keep doing it. Like, you don't, <laughs> you don't right. get to keep making decisions um, through that frame, right? You have to work to mitigate the potential negative impact of that of that bias. So, um, I think that any conversation around unconscious bias should include discussion about conscious bias and some of the real conscious bias that we have about you know employees at work and who should be in roles of authority and power, who should be promoted, or what kind of you know whether that that is that you know oh well. Pamela, you know, we have this big project, but it requires lots of travel. We probably don't want Pamela to do that. She's got those little kids or she's taking care of her mother who's sick, right? right, right. So like, there's a bias in that. You have to have a conversation with me about that. That that affects my employment and my potential and possibilities in the organization. So um, I just think they come hand in hand and one can't be used as an excuse to ignore the other. No, I think, I think it's just a great point. I think and the reason, so for me, it's it genuinely grinds my gears because a lot of times I think DNI is often framed from the context of, again, like majority comfort. So mm-hmm. I believe that there's a lot of language where we kind of like it's and it's subtle and it's kind of inserted all across the diversity of thought, unconscious bias, sometimes in ways to just kind of give folks an out. And so mm. I don't ever I, I, I can tell you, I, I don't ever hear conversations around conscious and unconscious bias. I hear it almost like it just automatically defaults to unconscious, almost in a way to say, like, it's not your fault. Right. Like it absolves yeah. you of responsibility as opposed to, OK, you have some actual biases and they're they're true. They're like these are these are actual real biases that you have and you conduct and you're aware of. Um, and they're not all mistakes. Um, and I think sometimes when you talk about diversity and inclusion, 
when we're not talking about actual biases. And again, not in a way that tries to make white folks feel bad, uh, but in a way that is just honest. I think that can, that can lead to more productive conversations. Like we're in a we're in an era today where, um, you know, twenty twenty election is coming up. We had we we had a whole um, a, a large part of America came came to really see itself four years ago, and I think we have like another one of these instances coming up. It's like one of the rare times I think in this space that we can start pointing to things and say, "Hey, this is a lightning rod moment. This is a lightning rod moment." And I think mm. it would be, we would be behooved to figure out a way to be a little bit more honest and like intentional with calling out some of these things. I think it's really dope that the way that you frame these conversations is is in the context of conscious and unconscious, but I can tell you like, I have never heard anybody do that. Yeah. I think a couple of things as you were talking came to mind. I think, um, you know, Making white folks comfortable is an important part of work around diversity and inclusion, right? <laughs> I do think I do think we have too many internal conversations that like leave out that group of people and it's important for us to it's important for them to feel like they can join the conversation and help make progress, right? Help make impact. And I think it's a fine line, right? Like it's a fine line and I walk it every day in my professional life to ensure that people feel like they can be part of the conversation without being accused of anything. Um, And, and and I work hard to create a space where people feel like they can be vulnerable and sort of divulge biases that they may realize right over the course of the conversation that we've had. Um, The other thing that I think is problematic, the other sort of side of this is like the call out culture that we don't actually, the, the more sort of, woke (laughs) our culture gets for you know lack of i feel like i date myself when i say woke i'm like no it's okay okay. i don't i don't have a snapchat i'm sorry Um, (laughs) but i think people 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 will be using woke for another another 10 years and you know most black and brown folks will be off it it's okay (laughs) (laughs) um but i think one of the one of the challenges with like woke culture right is that like we don't let people make mistakes Um, and people don't, so I think those two things are counterbalancing. Those things are like, there's tension there in that where we want to call things what they are, which I feel, you know, I feel strongly about, like, let's not use euphemisms to describe things. Let's talk about what the challenges are. Like, why is it that even in my unconscious bias work, lots of organizations will say, well, we really want to focus on gender diversity Right. Or we really want to focus on the our domestic workforce versus our global workforce. I don't I haven't had to this point a single organization. Maybe that's not true, but I haven't had very many organizations tell me we want to talk about race. Or like we want to talk about trans people. Right. Like I think so. I think that there's there are some final frontiers around diversity and inclusion that organizations are not interested in addressing and we have to get them interested in addressing those things we have to name that and say it's important for us to also talk about race right we can't limit can a conversation around diversity inclusion and bias and not talk about race that's an important component particularly in the united states of work workplace diversity and inclusion and on the other hand right we have to also like allow for people to show growth in those areas right. and to say, I am really uncomfortable talking about this or my experiences working with black people have not been positive or whatever it is so that we can make progress. So I don't know that I have the answer. I mean, I think these are like age old questions. Right. <laughs> I don't know that I have a solution for it, but I know that I'm constantly sort of teetering from one side of that to the other to try to create a space where people do feel like they can talk about it without any sort of shame and can, and can make progress on it. And I think, Oh, we got to have another whole and whole episode on this because like, I'm, I'm with you. Like I get what you're saying. I think for me as, and again, like, so context is everything. I'm a 30 year old straight black man. Um, and kind of coming up as a millennial, I'm really passionate, like with a history of like studying activism and 
just like the history of white supremacy in this country, it's it's challenging for me, like transparently, like right, it's cha- and vulnerably, it's challenging for me when yes, yeah, like people, members of the majority will say I'm really uncomfortable, and it's like okay, you're uncomfortable having a conversation, but like you still have really nothing to lose, right? Like yeah, like, like my life is uncomfortable. My, my whole life is uncomfortable. You have nothing to lose, like unless you like carve a swastika in my desk or spit on my face and call me the n-word like you're not gonna get fired right like this like this idea that like anybody can just get fired for anything like that's not true so like you're very much so protected by the very institutions you're uncomfortable discussing and so Mm. and so it's challenging for me from from like and as a as a as a dni practitioner as someone who is passionate about culture and transformation and change management it's challenging for me to like really figure out how to, to your point, like balance those two spaces. I agree that like yelling at people (laughs) like, or like, like lighten them up on Twitter is like not always the most is not productive. I also, I wish my, my desire as we look at this next generation of diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals. And as this work continues to grow and evolve um, by just the nature of time, is that there's mm. ways that we can leverage passion around justice and passion around and, and, and righteous indignation for a substantive corporate change. I think that like, I think, I think both are necessary. I think you need internal external and internal forces working together. I don't believe that like organizations change um, simply by merit of a bunch of internal corporatized work. I think that it also takes a certain level of activism that is that is external and i wonder i'm very curious about what would it look like for both of those forces to work in in some type of harmony or coordination for organizational transformation i think that there's an opportunity for it i haven't seen that yet oftentimes we'll see like something really crazy happen and then the organization will have to change because of again external pressures um or maybe like the ceo comes to some radical epiphany and then like they you know Um, obstacles be damned radically change organization but typically we haven't really seen those things work together and yeah i don't know if i don't know if we're really going to see it um uh, the needle move until that happens is that fair i think i think it is i mean it's you know i think me too is a good example of that Mm -hmm. right so Mm -hmm. like organizations for quite some time have had sort of compliance training around sexual harassment and there's, but, but the bar has been raised and s- I think societally around the expectation there and people have people who've behaved, men who've behaved badly have really seen punishment. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I wonder from what you're saying, I wonder what the equivalent of that is for race. Or how we, how race becomes, because I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just really interesting, again, sort of looking at the sample size of at least the work I've done across these hundreds of thousands of people and so many organizations, um, that it just still for a lot of people is like a subject they don't want to touch. Now, I do think, I do believe really strongly in the power of stories. Yeah. And I think something about what's happening in media hmm. that so many different stories are being told about so many different populations. Like there's a show that Netflix ran three seasons of called one day at a time. Yeah. And it's a remake of the old one day at a time, but it's a Cuban American family living in LA. And, you know, my family's from the Dominican Republic, my kids and I, and my husband, we watch that show like religiously and every season for three seasons, Netflix tried to cancel it. And there was like petitions and public outcry. And we're like, you need to tell these stories. And there are a hundred other things like that. And there's like humans of New York, yeah, which is telling crazy stories every day. And you look at this picture and then you read, um, you know, you read the description and you're like, Oh, I never would have guessed that. Right. I just never would have guessed it. And I think there's something about the, um, vastness of the stories being told and the vastness, the sort of depth of the media 
And so much of that is about race. Like I remember like two years ago, I read a humans of New York post yeah. and the, the gentleman behind humans of New York, um, was traveling and so it was in Africa and he was it was a young couple with a baby like a toddler and they said yeah we got we met in Indiana or something right they met at university and we got we, we got married and we got pregnant and we had to come back to Africa because we decided we couldn't raise our son in a country where he'd have to carry his race with him every day and I think of that twice a week sort of looking at my boys and I think the so just as an example of like you can read something or see a story and it can just stick with you and help you see something differently I posted I went to Essence Fest this year for the first time and Michelle Obama spoke and Mm -hmm. she had her hair um, curly and so I posted this picture of her on stage and me at the concert sort of side by side on Facebook yeah and said like You know, she let go of, I can't remember exactly what I said, but something like she let go of all her, like, now that she's not the first lady, she can be her true self. And and the power of seeing someone who looks like me in her position is not lost on me, right? And I Mm. wrote about how it was impactful that we had, like, the same hairstyle. Mm. (laughs) So, because I have have very curly, uh, naturally curly hair, which is a whole you know, a whole other conversation about whether that should be straight or not and and what professionalism looks like. But a colleague of mine, um, one of our, one of our senior leaders actually told me he saw my, we had a call about something else and he said, Hey, I saw that post and it just, I had never even considered like the decisions that you make about your hair. And it, and it was impactful for me to see it. So I think I'm sort of rambling, but I, no, I think not. that there is there's something happening around media and those stories that is like a, a groundswell. Like it is it's opening people's aperture for having the conversation and helping them feel empathy and curiosity and interest in these different stories and experiences versus laying their own negative story over race. And and I think I have an optimism that says this is going somewhere. Um, no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's another platform that, you know, has conversations with black and brown executives and leaders and all types of folks. You know? <laughs> called Living Corporate. You know, called Living Corporate. You know, we do this all the time. So, no, but I, I'm right there with you. I, I do. I think there's a, I think there's an increase in appetite. I think what I'm curious about, what I'm passionate about seeing is, frankly, like, what does it look like for platforms like Humans of New York, like Living Corporate, to develop some, like, not playfully or seriously, like, zoom in on Living Corporate, is just about what does it look like to take this storytelling approach and developing it into some type of programmatic inclusion effort for organizations, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. to me, like that's like the, the organization that can take this, mobilize it for in, internally for empathy, upskilling for inclusion, upskilling for leaders who can connect it with um, employee resource groups. Like that to me is like taking that next step because you're get, you, that's you capturing the voice of the of of your of your employees. That's you actually being able to take something tangible and create some meaningful solutions for your organization. Like that 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 creates that grassroots type movement, right? Like that's that's what I'm really interested in. And I think to your point around media, like digital media, it's 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 only growing. Like it's only going to continue to expand. And so, like, what does mm-hmm. that look like within the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Okay, Pamela, look, this has been a super dope conversation. We're way over time. Uh, we've been talking for an hour and a half, y'all. Thank y'all so much um, for listening <laughs> to the Living Corporate Podcast. Um, you know, we're on all the platforms. You Google us, okay? Type in Living Corporate, we'll pop up. But if you want to check out our website, living-corporate.com, please say the dash, living-corporate.com. Or you can do livingcorporate.co, livingcorporate.org, livingcorporate.tv, livingcorporate.net, livingcorporate.us. We got all the living corporates, uh, Pamela, except for livingcorporate.com. But we're eventually we're going to get livingcorporate.com. OK, but we have all the other living corporates. OK, now, if you want to check us out on Instagram, we're at living corporate. You want to check us on Twitter. It's living corp underscore pod. And you know what? If you want to send us a question, a listener letter, you know, something, you know, just just a shout out. Just contact us on the website or you can email us at living corporate podcast at gmail dot com or you can just DM us on social media because DMs are wide open. Um, I think that really does it for us today. I just have to thank uh, y'all for checking it out. Shout out to everybody listening and shout out to Pamela Fuller, leader, global thought partner, edge snatcher. OK, uh, 
<laughs> Mother of two, you know what I'm saying? Public speaker, mover, shaker, mentor, sponsor at uh, Franklin Covey. Till next time, y'all. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.